Welcome to The Secret Mind. Today we are continuing with a reading of Every Man and Enemy by W. Howard Baker. I can't just read the first few chapters and not finish the book. There's only 18 in it, so um, and it's not a long book. Let me read the back of the book for you. Every Man and Enemy, a publisher's house party at a pleasant Thameside villa, but among the guests was a killer. A killer who struck time and time again. A killer whose hand was turned against everyone who stood in his way, who murdered ruthlessly and with cold efficiency, a killer whose mind contained a devil's seed, leaving a harvest of death in his wake. I mean, come on. Um, I'm putting the text on the screen. I'm going to try a different style of splitting the screen today. Um, often in books, at the beginning, of there are disclaimers saying you can't reproduce the text in any form, but I want to put subtitles up, and this is the easiest way to do it. And in this book, there is no such disclaimer. There's just text. It's a Pulp Fiction book. There's nothing telling me I can't do that. I've bought the book. Why shouldn't I do what I want with it? So, if uh, whoever published this doesn't say. Can Books, is it? Um, Zenith Publications, London. Printed by Hunt Barnard, Aylesbury. Well, if they object, I'm sure they will let me know in the usual way. So here we go. Chapter 3. Every Man and Enemy by W. Howard Baker. John Bovis was the last of the feud. In every important particular, he'd not changed at all since 1940. True, he was leaner now, his voice was deeper now, and his black moustache was shorn to a more reasonable span. But basically, he hadn't changed. He was just a much a daredevil, as he'd ever been. He ran his publishing house as though it were a spitfire squadron and the reading public an enemy to be stormed, blasted and shocked into submission. And when one of his publications passed the 5,000 sale mark inside hard covers, he stuck a little paper roundel on his office wall. Of the others who had shared those thin, cold and clear September days with him in 1940, many had died. Most were only names on a roll of honour long before the war was over. As for the rest, they'd all grown older or wiser, or just grown up. Their circumstances had demanded this of them. They had been boys in 1940, contemptuous of death, because they did not truly understand it, unafraid because they were una unable to truly appreciate the fact that they were not immortal. They had taken risks with a laugh on their lips, because they hadn't truly divined the risks they were taking. They'd lived dangerously, and the business of living in the shadow of imminent death had been a grand and glorious game. But 1940 was 25 years behind them now. Five inches onto the waistline, one and a half onto the collar, they were all mature, reasonable thinking men now. Only John Bovis remained. He was very nearly as slim as he'd ever been, and he was not mature. Often, he was not even reasonable. Rarely did he consciously think. He lived as dangerously as he knew how in the publishing world as well as outside it. In respect of more than a quarter of the books that he published, he escaped proceedings at the Old Bailey only by the skin of his teeth. For he was equally contemptuous of the laws of libel, and those designed to restrain the publication of matter which might be held to deprave or corrupt. He subscribed to the view that there were only good books and bad books, and the bad ones weren't necessarily those which might bring a blush to a maidenly cheek. By his definition, a bad book was one which was just badly written, and these, and he included most of the women's novelettish works of D. H. Lawrence among them, he wouldn't publish at all. So he pressed on regardless, setting his own standards, which were frequently at variance with those unthinkingly accepted in the world around him, frequently flying very close to the wind, and, in peace as in war, trusting to luck. And he kept a grubby, balding teddy bear on his desk as a mascot. Only once in twenty-five years of war and of peace had Titus the Ted let him down. This had been over his marriage with Julia, Julia Westcott, the dark-eyed, sultry-looking girl he'd met at a squadron dance in 1941. He'd been attracted to her instantly, and she to him. Within half an hour, they'd been surprising each other with the discovery that they had complementary backgrounds. She was a novelist, and his father was her publisher. 
Within another half an hour, they were making quite a joke of it. Of course, she'd said breathlessly, in the back of his baby Austin, and nowhere else could one get more breathless than that. I'm only doing this so that you'll persuade your father to take my next book. Their courtship had been passionate, urgent and brief, and as, ma as many were in wartime. Instant happiness had been offered them, and they'd not stopped to question whether or not they were really suited, nor how long that happiness would last. They'd snatched at it greedily and married quickly. They'd been strangers, yet sharing a bed as man and wife. They'd not waited to truly get to know one another. Almost immediately afterwards, John Bovis had been posted out to North Africa, and the business of really getting to know the girl he'd married had perforce to be held over for the duration. It was only after the end of the war that they'd finally come to know one another, and then they had not liked what they knew. By this time, Bovis had assumed control of the family publishing house on the death of his father, and had revolutionised it. He started making a name for himself, and not as a publisher only. He'd long since graduated from the Baby, baby Austin. He drove real cars now. At Silverstone, he was known as Blinder Bovis for the chances he took on the circuit. He'd taken up motor racing as a hobby and drove for the Jaguar team. Silverstone saw him regularly, the continent often, the United States frequently, the hospitals once in a while. Speed intoxicated him, and he took many risks. When Julia remonstrated with him, he smiled at her in a superior, pitying sort of way. She was angry with him for being away so often. His passion for motor racing was not one she could or would share. When she told him that he'd kill himself if he did not when she told him that he'd kill himself if he did not give it up, he laughed out loud. What did she know about it? She'd never once come to see him race. And why should he kill himself? He'd come through the war unscathed, didn't he? She called him selfish then, and he told himself he knew what she was really complaining about. She wasn't truly concerned for his safety. She just wanted him on a string. She was inordinately possessive by nature. She was jealous of the time he devoted to racing and to his job. But he had to earn a living, hadn't he? She spent the money he made fast enough, didn't she? And he was entitled to a hobby, wasn't he? Even a dangerous one. He worked hard and had earned the right to play hard. But nothing would silence her complaint. She liked to go to fashionable parties and nightclubs and smart restaurants. And what would people think of her if he didn't take her? She would go a long way to be photographed, particularly for any one of the glosses. Mr and Mrs John Bovis pictured dancing together at the Cup of Gold. Mrs Bovis is better known as Julia Westcott, the best-selling authoress. That was the kind of caption she liked. Cynically, Bovis wondered, did she subconsciously realise she needed the publicity? For the fact was that though Julia had been his father's star author, she was now a star on the wane. Far from being a bestseller, her books now barely earned their cost of production. And what was even worse, from the critical point of view of John Bovis, the standard of her work had sadly deteriorated. The terrible thing was that she wouldn't discuss her work with him. He couldn't help her, as he found fault with her writing, so she waywardly accused him of selfish irresponsibility. How could he know what her work was really like? How could he judge when he'd never grown up? This is what she said. Bitterly. But even Bovis was not relying on his own judgment alone. He read every criticism he could lay his hands on. He studied sales figures and he studied every manuscript he was offered with his professional readers. The time came when, after a batch of particularly adverse readers' reports, he handed one of her novels back to her for rewriting. And that was the end. It was the end of their business relationship and the end of their marriage. The petty intolerances and frustrations of a dozen years had only needed this to give them their ultimate verbal expression. Both Julia and John each said things that they should have been ashamed even to think, and which, afterwards, both bitterly remembered. Technically, they remained man and wife for a further 11 months after that, and technically, they lived together for a part of this time. But their relationship was more of an armed truce than a marriage, and when Julia left him and presently sued for a divorce on the grounds of adultery with some woman unnamed, Bovis did not contest the action. 
the marriage was dead. The cleanest thing to do was to let the divorce bury. He continued to gamble with death on the circuit and to paste red, white and blue roundels on his office wall. Superficially, one would have said, marriage had not touched him at all, nor had divorce. In point of fact, both had, and deeply, though neither had basically changed him. He was still the last of the few. But these days he worked and played harder than ever, as if success on the track and in the bestseller list was some kind of proof that he'd been 100% right and Julia 100% wrong. He told himself continually that Julia was completely to blame for everything that happened. It had happened because she'd been a writer, he told himself. It had happened because their business arrangements had spilled over into their private life. He would never become emotionally entangled with any female writer ever again, he mentally promised. Women writers were poison. Julia was to blame for everything. He had to tell himself this and keep on repeating it. To have done anything else would have involved looking at himself squarely and objectively for the, for the first and only time in his life. And this he was, as yet, far from ready to do. Electric typewriters fired words in sharp bursts onto paper. Behind the glass door of a room labelled Art, someone was shouting his head off in Italian. Telephones rang just 15 feet away down a short corridor. Workmen were demolishing an interior wall. Plaster flew wide like shrapnel. Here was none of the quiet, cloistered calm Kirby had expected to find pervading a publisher's offices. The place was a battlefield. The tall redhead, who'd been brought out to them, had to raise her voice. Hello, Mr Innes. You've come on a bad day. Hammers swung. Clouds of choking dust swirled across the scene like a smokescreen. This is Mr Kirby, Innes was shouting. A sudden pause in the bombardment of noise. An hiatus. Silence, golden and brief. Kirby plunged in. We'd like to see Mr Bovis at once. We haven't got an appointment, but... The hammers started swinging again. The typewriters gave covering fire. Kirby found himself bellowing, It's very urgent! The redhead frowned. An attractive woman, almost violet blue eyes, high cheekbones, smooth, creamy complexion, a soft red mouth meant to yield. Kirby mentally wrote this description, almost subconsciously. He was always doing it. Then the soft red mouth moved to say something. But the din arose deafeningly. As it paused again, Kirby said, Mr Bovis knows Mr Innes, of course, but he doesn't know me, or rather, we've never met. But tell him I'm Arthur Kirby of the Daily Post. Will you do that? And tell him. I'm afraid, said the redhead, Mr Bovis is out. Oh, all right then, we'll wait. She looked apologetic. You might have to wait a very long time. It could be all day. She was hurrying now, slurring her words afraid that the racket was about to begin again any moment. But it wasn't. A trolley had suddenly made its appearance. Everything stops for tea. She said, we're having some alterations done, as you can see. I don't know when Mr Bovis will be back. And that was when a small sigh of relief made itself heard. Thank you, said Harvey Innes, and made for the door. Oh, no, you don't, Kirby said firmly and grabbed him. Not when I've got you this far. The woman looked startled. He spoke to her over his shoulder. Can you tell me where Mr Bovis has gone? I, I assure you that what we want to see him about really is very urgent. Her wide blue eyes flicked from the columnist to the palpably unwilling Harvey Innes and back again. She said a little doubtfully, I don't know where he is at the moment or I could get hold of him for you. The noise was getting on his nerves rather. That... Kirby said. I can believe. I know where he's due in about half an hour, if that's any good. Fine, she nodded. All right, I'll get you the address. She crossed the office and passed through a door set in the far wall. Kirby watched her go. He enjoyed watching her go. She was finely curved and long-legged. The clothes that she wore, a narrow black carefully tailored skirt and a white poplin blouse, set off her figure and her colouring to perfection. His voice, carefully expressionless, he asked Harvey Innes, 
Who is she? He made it sound as if he wouldn't mind mind if he never had an answer. But Harvey Ennis had known Kirby just as long as Kirby had known him. He wasn't deceived. He said dryly, Her name's Carla Scott, but you'd be wasting your time. Kirby looked rather surprised. Wasting his time with a woman like that? He sought enlightenment, frowning. Surely she's not one of those. Harvey Ennis looked at him. What I meant, he said patiently, was that she's been John Bovis' secretary for the last three years, and she's going to be his wife sometime during the next three. Oh, oh, it's like that, and what does he think about it? He doesn't know yet, but when he does, he's going to be tickled to death. Hmm. Kirby's battered face was momentarily glum. Then it brightened. Was she the unnamed woman in the divorce action? Yes, Kirby frowned again. How did you know I was going to say that? I can read you like a book, Splash, Harvey Innes said wearily. And it's not one I'd recommend to a teenager. Well, was she? Always on the lookout for a story, eh? Well, you can forget this one. It died before it reached you. She isn't the woman. Who was? There was no woman, Harvey Innes said. It was all in Julia Westcott's imagination. But John Bovis was sick of the whole thing, heartily sick of it. He let it go through, undefended. The door on the other side of the room opened again. Carla Scott reappeared. I've got that address for you where Mr Bovis is due about 30 minutes from now. It's 252 Baker Street. Kirby looked staggered. What? he exclaimed. 252 Baker Street. Carla Scott said again patiently. But Kirby wasn't listening. Instead, he was urgently gripping Innes's arm. Come on, Harvey. Thank you, Miss Scott. They left Bovis's office at a steady canter. What's all this about? Harvey Innes demanded as Kirby thrust him into a car. Why all the excitement? What's so special about 252 Baker Street, then? You don't know who lives there, Kirby said, his voice rising. Then almost to himself, gnawing his lip. What's he going to see him for? Something going on that I know nothing about. He sounded aggrieved. A journalist shut out of a story. Who does live there, damn it? Harvey Innes insisted. But Kirby was too busy crashing his gears to give him an answer. In any case, he was soon to find out. See you tomorrow.